I'll be reading the first poem from Capacity called The British Countryside in Pictures, which is itself the title of a book of photographs that was taken in the 1930s, but not released until, uh, until after the war in 1946, with the war sandwiched in there between. And the photographs are very affecting to me, and yet it's difficult to look at them and not be aware that what is beautiful in them comes at the cost of all that England was able to put together uh, for itself uh, in its uh, imperiousness um, in terms of uh, the suffering that it led itself to and was the agent of in many of its colonies in the late 19th century and, and even beyond. So that what does show up in the photographs is accompanied by things that don't show, but that are, are nonetheless certainly implicit and probably responsible for why what shows shows as, as beautifully as it does. The British Countryside in Pictures the frontispiece fixes as British a man whose livelihood is the grass. As he had before the take and since, he plies away in the sun. Market day. Storefront awnings slope into the square. Among the occupied, only the vendors are without hats. Well-fatted, sweet, and full of pickle are the hooked gibbets of beef above the pens. The plate after tractors on parade is untitled. For the village high street's walls converge at the far end, a motor car has entered and parked. Pictured empty in another, the new Great West Road has working fields to either side. In the one format, affordable and bound print by print, grass advances as a factor never to be run out of by a people at home. The farmer is to be seen as having at last put dearth right. Nature was on its own side always, necessary against nature sometimes to forbear from making more mouths to feed. With the poorest twelfth begetting half the nation, the interests of soil and race were served by the politics of the straight furrow. In the countryside alone it was, that one was spared meeting the less right sort of girl. Need. It had become at last what only others knew, even if they were in one's midst. Outside in Kenya, Madras, Shansi, Kiaramobim, nature had put in place disastrous shortfalls, need and epidemic. Nature had played out Ireland again. Of those invisible millions who were gone, nothing was missing. Nothing was missing for them. There without need, they were the revenant in England's garden. They were the ones whose absence is their sign. Of the unperceived who keep safe hold where they hide, vision is a forgetting. The British were those whom nature let bring home as grave clothes to the ones it starved, arboreal and floral plantings. England was green. There belonged ill-matched to many their likely allotments of soil. Across the range of them from kitchen gardens to plaisance, these were not brandished. They were kept up. While there were throwback native cottagers who grew potatoes, a weekly show on gardening was aired. All crystal sets picked up the BBC. Because those grounds least frequented were grounds where need was least, of most avail was a garden if no one was there. The walled reserve was model. Its expert and only viewers were staff. What showed above the fine clean tilth was surplus, from its abounding beds each day, staff saw to it for one. By the gardens having made an excess of nature, nature was trumped. Need had been made less natural. Replaced was the old productive ideal that the useful good was desired. 
the desired good was useful in the new ideal. Things become useless in the hoarding of them. Needed for a nation's surfeit of goods were buyers primed by their wanting. Desire's deputy was the person in love. An appetite need not slacken if what one craves is the scarce, and there is but the one beloved only. No hunger feeds so on itself as being able never to have one's fill of someone prized. They had become friends. It would not have occurred to him that she did not love him. Of course she did. Friends love one another. It began to explain his finding now that along with love she also gives him desire. Under something the sway of which is undue, in love with her, he learns that he has had cleared inside him a constructed garden-like place. He practices his absence as the stilled reflecting surface of its pool. With features of her person in his stead there, to what is not its own any more in wanting, the self is sent back by the other. Far enough beyond reason already is any one such transport, improbable twice over that with the same conclusive keenness she should want him. He looks for cues that he too had given her desire. They are not there. There is the coming war to think of as well. With conscription on its way, better to be no more than genial with her for now. That is why it is her suitcases he reaches for when he meets her at the St. Pancras train. Right from the start he is off ahead of her efficiently down the platform. Against him from behind, her fingers have it in them that she will have to break away too soon again for her return north. Out of her greeting hand on his back he walks. For no longer than withdrawal itself takes, her touch had been there. Wondering at its light circumspect grace, he does not mistake its bidding. What she wants, he can from this time on want for her. There can be no help for them now, since what she wants is him. Made nearly bearable by desire is one's not being able to withstand the desired. The hurried meetings follow. Their wanting one another comes to take on greed as its base. From the next moment between them least likely to be surpassed, they carry away from one another into their days away more wanting. It will be weeks. To be with her through them instead. If they could be already beyond the war and years on, they might have lives. Whole patches of days would have to be discordant, humdrum. Rote would help them through. Given ordinary times to lift her from, have her lift him, he would have come to preside with her over their chances. Around them everywhere was the petition that dailiness might hold its gracious own. Toward it came sandbags on the corner pavements. Post office pillar boxes were rigged with gas-detecting paint. The mask itself smelled of rubber. What one saw first through its eye shield was one's own canister snout, Leaflets from the Lord Privy Seal's office were evacuation, why and how, and if the invader comes. So the enemy might lose themselves in their confusion, the station signposts came down. There were now barrage balloons overhead and searchlights. The Anderson shelter was corrugated steel. It needed a garden to be sunk in. Two million more acres were to come under the plow. Collected for their great trek out of the city, the children walked crocodile to the trains, a loudspeaker telling them, don't play with the doors and windows if you don't mind, thank you. Villages and towns were to accept a number equal to their populations. Each child had a pinned label. Each was allowed one toy. They were met at the other end by strangers who had come to see who they were. A lady with a clipboard sought billets for them. 
some of them were in tatters. The more doleful were often the last picked. This was to be where they would live now for a time, out here in the country. Files of them traipsed the lanes behind their teachers. They were shown how to strip hop vines, how to make rush baskets out of reeds. Boys served as beaters for the pheasant shoots. Harvest, of course, meant that sheaves had to be carted. The sturdier of both sexes were put to work in the fields. No bombs fell into the warm, beautiful autumn. Most of the children went back home. When it was time to leave again for the country, few of them did. Above the blackouts, the Germans were led at first by moonlight up the Thames estuary. Then it was by the fires. Sounding like stones being thrown at the front wall, the incendiaries melted steel. Bombs that screamed their way into the city thudded down. A smell of cordite followed. Looked to be needed each month were twenty million feet of seasoned coffin timber. There were no more blue waterproof bags. With the raids coming every night but one, the dead might have to be dumped in the channel. It is in bodies given to be seen that ghosts meet their term. Their transparency is no less restive. Escapes that would fail are patent already in the pre-war countryside exposed. Phantom in a picture are gaps that might have been filled by a child. One plate is called a quiet corner. A trading wherry is about to tie up. Full sunlight has to itself again for the afternoon, the bench an East End child had jumped from for her sprint to the canal. She had seen that ropes needed securing. Having called to her up the slope, the bargeman was mindful that at that same lock last spring, a man had asked to take his picture. There are pollarded willows in the picture, in another a hedge-crowned wall. The stills of the countryside are composures. They apply to keeping outcome at bay. Nameable, all finite things are present to one another for as long as they show. The bedding planes first. Ready never to be seen as country, they are exposed sometimes as its side. On show in their single plots, slate, shale and wheeled clay, marl, the tertiaries, chalk and upper green sand. A former seafloor laid down shell by shell, limestone dislikes interruption. As stuffs from its lighter understories wear away, streams take their sources back farther with them into the scarp. The caprock outliers they leave are often wooded. Sight is of the senses, the one that most lends itself to remove. Each prospect for the looker-on is his without trespass. Across the tiers of house rows up from the river, each profile shows what its volume stretches to from its midpoint out. The ridges to their backs are in cloud where the sheep pass down from high summer grazing. Their drove road takes the turn of the hill. Inviting the indicative, the Thai bulwarked lawn above it has its copy in the mill pond's glaze. Another figure appears who speaks English. Upfield from the crude railing over a footbridge, his alternately forward knees are caught mid-stride. 